Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International New York, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, DDG, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Corman Communities, a.k.a. Hotels, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Popular Community Bank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and These Friends. They call it jewelry. They call it fine jewelry. It's a design. It's a product. And today I have an individual who has such a unique background who has created her own jewelry, including retailing. My friend Apolita, how are you? Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay, now look, I didn't wear the chains. I really wanted to wear it. You know, <laughs> some of it would be there, you know, and but I promise the next time I'll be wearing the cufflinks. So I know we're going to have that. So let's talk about it and tell me a little bit about, tell me about your parents. Your, your mother was an American, your father was an Italian. So t yeah, so uh, my mother uh, was born in Chicago. She went to Smith and went to Italy on her junior year abroad like uh, many girls did then and I guess still do now. And she met my father and decided to elope. So my, my grandparents were not very happy about that. They tried to convince her to not do that and come home. And she said, no, I'm leaving school and I'm getting married. <laughs> so tell me about your dad, because you told me when we got together that your dad really originally came from a privileged family and uh, they had a, a good life and he, he didn't really, he wasn't a great businessman. He was a unique individual. Yes, <laughs> that's, uh, that's We, we know he's going to watch us on YouTube, so we're going to make <laughs> him feel good. He was success, but he, he, business wasn't his real success. Right? Yeah, business was not his strong suit. He was an intellectual, and interestingly, in Europe, uh, being an intellectual is actually a profession, and even though you can't exactly put your finger on what exactly that means and how you make a living at it, but it's it's writing, it's being engaged in the cultural currents of the moment. And but he, uh, he originally the family owned real estate. They owned uh, yes, his family owned lots of real estate in Via Roma, which is one of the principal streets in Florence. And somehow, in uh, in a couple of generations, they somehow managed to lose everything. And so my father, who had started out as a very privileged uh, child, you know, ended up in his mid-twenties as sort of, you know, a normal. So, so now there's the, the young lady from uh, the Midwest who went to Smith, who is living in Florence, and there is this child born. And you spend a couple years there, and then you come back to New York, right? Yes, they decide maybe it's better to try to see if we can make a go of it in New York. You're, what, three years of age at this time? I was about three. And, and uh, where they settle in, uh, in Nueva York? on the Upper West Side. We lived at 101st and uh, West End Avenue. Right, which also was intellectual area because the Upper West Side had that intellectual with the Columbia and all the rest. 
In fact, it was it was uh, it was a very interesting time, and uh, I felt even though I was very small that uh, we were sort of in a real community of, uh, and it was the 60s, so there was a lot of you know agitating going on, and so and and you really felt like things were you know were were going on and that were very interesting that you could participate in, but it was. Um, it was also a little bit dangerous, and uh, so we, the Upper West Side at that time was a little dangerous. And uh, and so after two or three incidents with uh, you know with gunpoint, <laughs> my my father said, "Okay, that's it. We're going back to Italy." When he was here, he was working in publishing. You said, "Yeah, he was working at Bantam Books at the time, uh, on the production side." And, uh, and he was doing very well, and I think he really loved it and, and enjoyed it a lot. And then he got into theater while he was here as well. So that was the start of what was then going to be a long career. That's, so now you're about eight years of age when you move back? Six. Six years of age. You moved back at six years of age. You moved back to Florence, and you moved into this, this home. I don't call it a medieval castle. We'll call it a medieval home. Yes. When I knew we knew the Upper West Side might have been a little rustic, but living in a building that didn't have power. Yes, it was. A, it was pretty much. It was a shock because um, we went from being in an experimental school because everything was experimental in the late '60s. So I was uh, in first grade at the time, and you would go to school, and they say, "What shall we do today? Let's bake a cake." You know, that, that was the curriculum. To then moving to Italy, where uh, because the, the house we moved into was right outside the city, we were in a very small little school that had first, second, and third grade all in one classroom. And, you know, extremely traditional, extremely strict. And that was a, that was a shock to the system. Now, so. but you, you said to me when you were living in that, and it took three years before you had electric power in the, in, in, in the, in the building, uh, something was interesting. Your father got involved with experimental theater. What do you mean by experimental theater? Well, non-traditional types of, of performance. Basically, uh, there was a lot of traipsing around in the woods and somehow trying to bring an audience over there to witness it. And also then in traditional theaters, sort of where the audience and the actors would be commingling so you wouldn't exactly know. There wasn't like a real stage. Uh, and, you know, and just sort of very experimenting around, uh, you know, around staging and performance. And, and wasn't it true that you became a prop in many instances? <laughs> yes, you spend a lot of time being a prop. Yes, not really knowing what going, here, sit under this sheet. <laughs> yeah, but when you were growing up, you, you know, besides the, the, the theater and all those great experiences, you, you learned a little bit about sculpturing? And the art. Yes, I went to art school, uh, and uh, I went to a very traditional art school where it was the last of the trade of the great trade schools, where once upon a time you would leave this school and then go directly to work in one of those trades. So four four to five hours a day, you are studying your trade, whether it was weaving or sculpting or. And what was your trade at that? Sculp sculpture. So you're doing sculpture. And also at that time, because it also has some effect on your life later on, you also were in dance, right? Yes. Throughout my whole childhood, I danced and I did a lot of classical ballet, as well as modern and gram and, you know, I basically tried everything. So now, okay, you go back at six and you're 18, and as you said to me, you decided it's time to leave Italy. And I said, why don't you go to New York City? You said it was too close by. <laughs> so you, you fly from Italy. Now, you go to Los Angeles, but you go to this little place called Silver Lake. How do you end up at Silver Lake? Your mother's? My, my mother's youngest uh, sister had just moved there the week before. She was a costume designer. So I, I literally arrived in New York, thought, I'm still too close to Italy. This is too European. I need to go to America. So I got on a plane and literally called her when I got there. And I said, can I crash at your place? And she said, OK, fine. I'm in Silver Lake. So uh, I didn't know any better. And I you know, went to her house. And, and you took uh, out a map, right? Something, a map, and you found Beverly Hills? What is this? The Beverly Hillbillies were around, okay? <laughs> it was very funny because I don't know if you know this map, but 
Los Angeles is so large that there is no actual single map that shows you LA. It comes in a book that. That's right, like the Hackstrom books, you know, <laughs> 22 maps, okay. Yeah, it, it's, like a, it's like a phone book, it has a million pages. So anyway, looking through this, this map book, I was like, okay, Beverly Hills, I heard of that. I'm going to go there to look now for a job. Look for a job. Now, it's interesting because here is this person who is born in Florence, who comes to New York, who returns to Italy, who, ha who speaks perfect English, and... Your day, your first day in Beverly Hills, you get a jaywalking ticket? <laughs> yeah, I got a jaywalking ticket and I've never heard of it. So I, I, thought, that, I thought the officer was kidding. <laughs> so I almost got arrested because I kept saying, you're kidding, right? And he, and he kept saying he thought I was you know, taking now, now advantage of The interesting of it. thing is this was the, uh, this was the, set, the, the 80s, the early 80s, and at that time, there were plenty of jobs, and you said to me, you walked down the streets of Beverly Hills, and there were signs in a lot of stores, you know, and you walked in, and you walked into a bookstore, a Crown Books, and you get a job as a sales clerk, right? Yeah. And to me, it was miraculous that, that you could just walk into a store and get a job on the spot, you know, like no training, no, no years of like learning, you know, no, no nepotism, no needing to know the uncle of someone. You know, this was, it was just. And like, you weren't a prop. Oh, I know. Okay. <laughs> and I wasn't a prop. It was, uh, it was just, uh, it was very exciting, I must say. So, so basically, I just picked the one I liked the best. You know, there were clothing stores, there were other types of stores. And so I thought, oh, you know what? I love books. I'll work in a bookstore. And six months later, he became the manager because they had such a small turnover. Yeah. <laughs> and it was very funny being in Beverly Hills because, uh, like, Fred Astaire would come in every day and every single day practically have an accident in the parking lot. <laughs> and this was, oh, there's Fred Astaire. <laughs> you know? And it was, very, it was very fun. Then you decide to, uh, uh, to go to college out there. Yes, uh, I applied to go to college, and I received a scholarship. And uh, then my, that was a real turning point, because I had been working for a couple of years at this point, and, um, you know, and I was ready to go back to school. And I was kind, and I, it was nice because I was in, in a real, sort of, in a more serious mindset. And, um, and already much more academically sort of inclined because in Europe school is, is much harder. So it was kind of a, a, a strange disconnect because the, the kids my, that were coming into school at the same time were at a completely different sort of place. And it allowed me to really take advantage of every single thing that the so school had to offer. But you were really, because you had the stipend and um, you you finished college in what, two years? Two in two and, years. Two years, mm -hmm. and you got involved once again in dance, right, when you were at, uh, at, at college. Yes, so uh, they had a wonderful, wonderful dance studio, <coughs> but no dance department. So therefore, it was a fantastic opportunity for me to just sort of take over, and uh, essentially that's what I did. And I formed a dance group there that collaborated with other types of musicians and writers. Uh, it, the group was called Rhyme. Live. I'm going to be a choreographer, right? <laughs> yes, choreography was really my main focus, more, more so than performance even. And so. so you finish school and you try to be a choreographer, right? Yes, I decided that I was going to try to give it a go. And in L.A. at the time, there wasn't really enough of a of a dance scene, enough of a dance audience, really. So I decided to come back to New York at that point. And, um, and then after, you know, being here for a while. But you came back to New York originally to try choreography also in the dance group. Yes, yes. And uh, then you decide that after that uh, it's time to make a living. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not Rome, uh, Florence, to make a living and you, um, you get a job where, in a uh, book company? Yes, I worked, uh, so after the dance didn't quite work out, I thought, well, I'll work in my second love, in the area of my second love, which was literature. And so I got a job as the assistant to the managing editor of Harper and Row. And you're, you're there, and then 
there's a little turning point. Uh, you uh, you become pregnant, and you um, then you decide uh, to take care of your daughter. You get married, and you and you're and you one day. What was it? The, the, the one of the your 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 daughter's parents' friends was trying to make macaroni jewelry. Tell me about that. <laughs> Yeah, so the mother, you know, how it is when you have children, what ends up happening is that you socialize with the parents that are the, the parents of your, of your children's friends, you know, so you don't necessarily pick your friends at that age. And, uh, and so I started spending time with this, uh, with this girl, and she fancied herself a jewelry designer. So I said, okay, well, what do you do? Show me what you do. And basically she was making you know, very sort of simple beaded jewelry. And, uh, and therefore, I said, well, you know, I know a lot about art. I have a lot of craft background. Maybe I can help you a little bit. And I started, I started helping her, you know, try to form an idea of exactly what kind of jewelry she, was, she wanted to make. And, and you rented a, uh, a desk at a, uh, a d on, in, off 22nd, 23rd, and Park Avenue, right? Yeah, so I had a, I had a little bench, and uh, because I have a sculpture background, I act, you know, the, the tools are the same except in miniature. So the craft part of it is very similar to uh, sculpting, and the materials are very similar, and the practices are very similar. So, so I started, uh, you know, I had, uh, even though I, I came from an art background, I, I hadn't really had much exposure to fashion at all. So for me, it was all new. So Now, you lasted and she left, right? Yes. Well, what happened was her husband got transferred kind of overnight to Europe. And so then there she was gone. And then here I was left with this jewelry uh, endeavor. So what happens one day, you know? Out of you're, you're you're crafting some jewelry, and one day, Banana Republic. I mean, and if people you know go back many years ago, Banana Republic was created as a safari line. Okay, you know they were the Jay Peterman of the safari line and the African products and all the rest. What is this young lady who has a daughter over here and she's crafting at her table do? with Banana Republic, and how do you find Banana Republic? There were a few <laughs> stores. There were, there were gaps, but Banana Republic had limited stores. I know, it was, uh, well, they had just transitioned for, out of this safari and in into this sort of more modern uh, look that they have now. And, uh, and they didn't have any other categories other than their core category yeah, but how'd of you clothing. you decide that you were gonna well, make jewelry for a, uh, a retailer? Well, it was, it was, uh, a very sort of fortuitous thing. I realized that I had a knack for understanding how to identify different customers just by going into stores and saying, oh, well, it's clear that the Bergdorf customer, the, the Bergdorf lady, wants this kind of necklace, whereas the Banana Republic lady Banana wants Banana Republic it. didn't have jewelry. They, I mean, they had, <laughs> they had safari clothing, you know, they, they had khakis. I mean, they didn't know about this on jewelry. How do you have the nerve to walk into the buying office of Banana Republic? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Ignorance is bliss. I think that's the question. <laughs> That's the answer there. Um, yeah, I, do, I actually don't even know how that, how that, I put two and two together, but uh, I basically cold called and somehow. Did you have any product? No. <laughs> but that was another sort of advantage I found out later. Because I, I talked to them and I said, you know, I, I see an opportunity here for you. And they see, and they said, you know, that's so interesting that right. you would didn't say that. Didn't they just that. hire a buyer, a jewelry buyer, that day? Yeah, they said no. They had, you know, it's funny you should say that because we just got a budget approved to do accessories, so come in and we'll talk. So I went in and said, I know exactly what you need, and I think I can design it for you. And they said, a forty-dollar uh, piece of custom jewelry, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, that would that was about the range, forty dollars. Yeah. Sometimes it might go to eighty, but yeah, forty dollars. Now, so you, you they buy the, uh, the concept, and you get into a couple of stores, like three stores. 
Yeah, we started very small and it, you know, of course it wouldn't have worked any other way because I didn't actually know how to do anything at that point and in you time. Didn't know, you didn't know where to manufacture it either. Yes. You subsequently, were, oh, the, the, the little person over there with the, with the four-year-old daughter is walking down at the 47th Street. The, okay, could you manufacture this for me? <laughs> it, it was like that, it was like that. And, and honestly, in some ways it's that easy, meaning you start at the ground level, literally going into stores and saying, you know, where, where can you direct me to somebody who could help me? And they say, oh, my cousin has a shop in Queens. <laughs> and so, okay, oh no, my uncle has a shop in Long Island City. And so you slowly start to form a network of people who can manufacture for you. Yeah, but from three stores, you get up to 300 stores? Yes. That, that's not a small little business by this time. Over no, there. no, it took several years. Of course, that wasn't overnight. Right, and, and, then you, and then you started sourcing. You went to Europe. You went to, you, you went to China, okay? But this was all a, a costume jewelry line over there. Yes. Then one day, this young lady who has a little, as we would say in my trade, a little chutzpah, <laughs> decides to walk into a store on the corner of 57th Street and 5th Avenue called Bergdorf Goodman's? Yes. Tell me what happens over there. <laughs> well, after I had doing, I've been doing costume jewelry for a while, I felt the need to really uh, have a line that expressed my aesthetic more than somebody else's aesthetic. And so, but I had no customers and I had no direct relationship. You had Banana me. Republic, I mean. Well, yeah, yeah but that was right. one customer. <laughs> I had no customers for my own line. So I thought, well, since I have no customers, it doesn't really matter what I do, so I can do anything I want. And I did some really crazy, large, very sculptural uh, gold necklaces that were more sculptures than necklaces. Were they, were, they, were they similar to what you're wearing now? No, not at all. Not at all. They, they were more sculptures than necklaces, you know, like big... Oh, wait, you mean like the pharaohs? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It was a, uh, it was very Renaissance Ramius, inspired. Ramius twelve over yeah. there, right? Yes, it was sort of Renaissance inspired because uh, you know when I think of when I think of jewelry, my historical inspiration, I really think of jewelry as represented in paintings. Not, I don't really think of jewelry that people really want to wear or that, you know, it was more ceremonial jewelry. So you meet the buyer over there at Bergdorf's. So I met the fashion director, yeah. and and that was a, one of a, a key thing because she said, you know. This is amazing jewelry, but she really was, since she wasn't the buyer, she wasn't really looking to buy. She was saying, you know, this is amazing. We should just put it in the window. And, you know. In the window, but not on the, not on the roof not of the floors. A, not on the floor. It's like, I'm sure we can't sell it, but we can put it in the window. And what happens in the windows? So we put it in the window, and in fact, they end up selling a few pieces. So then I got sort of passed on to the buyer, and, uh, and the buyer who was also new, thought that I was an existing designer from the store, and she said, okay, well, great, well, where's your next collection? And so that's when it really solidified in my mind. It's like, wait a minute, this is like a real so, opportunity so, to make a move here. So let, but let's look, you were in the costume. Now, did you make the direct move from costume to fine or a combination of costume fine and fine? No, they were two completely separate things. What happened though is that, of course, I couldn't abandon my costume business immediately because I was actively, you know, engaged it was in paying, business. It was paying, it was for paying a the living. bills. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, and honestly, I didn't really know anything about fine jewelry. Uh, I knew a lot about craft, but that, that's a far cry from actually having an aesthetic and a well developed line. So, uh, so there was a bit of a learning curve there at the beginning. And then finally you, you, you're selling a little jewelry, more than a little jewelry in Bergdorf's, and an interesting situation. Bergdorf is acquired by Neiman Marcus, right? Yes. Bergdorf's is acquired by Neiman's, and so suddenly uh, the buying teams uh, kind of merge and are sort of expo you're exposed to many more different opportunities than, than you were just at one store. And they said, okay, well, who are your top designers? And they, you know, I was among them. And they said, okay, great. Well, we'll roll you out to, you know, 10 Neiman Marcus stores. And uh, be because there's no Neiman's in New York, I didn't really know. Uh, I had no idea what a Neiman's was. What a Neiman's was. And I didn't really understand that opportunity either. 
And uh, so, you don't think they would do Texas would uh, have the desire for your product? Well, I'd never been to Texas, <laughs> so I guess uh, I, I didn't really have a, a picture of that now, market. What was interesting, you know, because it was costume, and then, as you said to me, one of the other interesting things is that you took stones. You, you combine fine jewelry with stones, and you told me each, each of one of your products, the stone, are hand-cut in Thailand, in y Bangkok, right? Yes. To backtrack one second, one of the key sort of uh, the keys to my success was that because I came from from fashion, from the more sort of more fashion point of view, uh, because I had been doing costume and costume travels at a much faster rate than traditional fine jewelry, I had a more contemporary point of view on what the product needed to be. So when I started doing fine jewelry, I was looking around for what other fine jewelry lines might be around that fit a more contemporary aesthetic, and there really wasn't any. So that was my great advantage to, to sort of see that opportunity and say, okay, well, you know what, I'm designing for myself. Like, where's the jewelry for me? Something different, something unique. So from Neiman's, so then you get into a couple of others, Saks, Bloomingdale's, Harrods in London, uh, Holt in, in Canada. I mean, you get into all the, uh, the the best department stores where today you have all these. And then you also get into um, some of the finer jewelry stores who would ship over there. Let's talk about later on, how do you decide to go in your own retail store? Well, one of the uh, one of the frustrations I would say of being in someone else's store is that you can't control the display, you can't control, you know, you can't control many things because it's their store. So I always wanted the opportunity to be able to showcase my work the way that I wanted to showcase it because so much of the story, so much of the romance, is you know is how you present it and the type of experience the customer has when they when they come to the jewelry. So I'd wanted to do it for a long time, but it's a very expensive proposition, and you know, and it's a whole other business. So when did you open up uh, your first uh, first store? Because I know there's going to be plenty more. The first store, which is on Madison it, Avenue. Yes, it's only been open for three months, so it's very very new. But we're super super excited because it's you know it's it's so fun to have a home. With 30 seconds left, tell me about your daughter. <laughs> My daughter is now 24 and living in San Francisco, and she is also an entrepreneur. I mean, she didn't get the jewelry bug, but she definitely got the entrepreneurship bug. And so it's very, very fun because now we can sort of feed off each other and she can sort of indicate to me where to go next. So what I would say is uh, you have, you know, I've done interesting people and you've been one of the most interesting and I'm so <laughs> happy and I want to see more stores and I want to see the men's line, which I know is going to be around. Coming soon. Okay, coming soon. And I'll be wearing the cufflinks and I'd like to thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this.